Thank you to Dean Joe for inviting me to preach for the Patronal Festival of St. James. It's good to be back, it's good to be in familiar territory, and it's good to participate in cathedral life as a new chapter unfolds in its long and interesting story. Of the vast number of sermons I've heard over a lifetime in the ministry, for some reason, a few really stand out. One, however, is the sermon preached at my installation as dean in this cathedral church in 1995 by the then Darson Bishop John Dennis. He talked of the identity, I remember, of Silly Suffolk, to be translated, of course, Holy Suffolk, with its treasure of St. Edmund, King and Martyr. Bishop John continued with a quip based on the then current renumbering of the A45 to be the A14. He pointed out that if you want to understand the character of Suffolk, compare the signposts in Cambridgeshire and Suffolk with one another. A feat Cambridgeshire had regular signs A14, formerly A45. You crossed into Suffolk and the unadorned message changed to A14 was A45. Bishop John also picked up on the slightly incongruous fact that St Edmundsbury Cathedral was, in those days, dedicated solely to the Apostle St James the Great. His rationale was that of the great churches in waiting on the historic abbey, St. Mary's was built for the parish and St. James for the use of pilgrims. Certainly St. James Church owes its dedication to the son of Zebedee as Santiago de Compostela, St. James of Compostela. It was built to assuage the disappointment of the 12th century abbot Anselm when the king would not countenance his absence on pilgrimage to Compostela. Compostela must be brought to bury St Edmunds. The Church of St James was rebuilt by John Wastel in 1503 and we celebrated the quincentenary in 2003. I've still got the mug. Of course, another architectural great associated with this place is Stephen Dyke's Bower. The glorious medieval colour reminiscent of an exquisite manuscript such as the Berry Bible is his vision. None of our great cathedrals, I think, can lift your soul in quite the way that this one does. It was SDB's insistence that the architecture of the cathedral should resonate to the inspiration of Compostela. He incorporated Moorish architectural influences in the arches and the metalwork. It always surprised me that he did not find a way to incorporate the great swinging censer, the Botafumero of Compostela, into the Cathedral of St. James. Maybe a challenge for the present Dean and Chapter. <laughs> Stephen Dykes Bauer invited me to meet him as soon as my appointment was announced. I decided not to wait until I was installed and made an immediate appointment to see him. Sadly, he died before the date of our assignation. However, he had set up a surprise for the new dean. During my first week, his trustees announced that he had left the combined wealth of his family to further the architectural development of St. Edmundsbury Cathedral. However, only if the dean cooperated with his vision otherwise the trustees were to favour Westminster Abbey. And every time I met the Dean of Westminster, he used to inquire whether I'd blotted my copybook. I felt not altogether altruistically. SDB actually 
ruled against building a tower with his bequest, which turned out to be three million pounds, he knew it would be nowhere near sufficient. However, at the time, the Millennium Commission had come into being, enabling a proportion of the national lottery funding to be used to celebrate the millennium across the nation. If the commission adopted a project, they were in the business of doubling funding raised locally. The lottery was still in its infancy and many regarded its money as tainted. But in the end, the cathedral council, as it was in those days, supported a bid and the Dykes Bar trustees agreed to allow their money to be used as collateral, provided SDB's nominated works were included in the total project. The strategy was to raise three million locally, bringing the total with the Dykes Bar bequest to six million and invite the commission to double it. After two disappointments when we were turned down, at the 11th hour with an article in the Times and another in Private Eye. Like the exodus of old, the tide suddenly turned. One Thursday morning, a fax came through to the cathedral office, summoning us to the Angel Hotel at 11 a.m. for a press conference to announce the award. And so the tower was to be built. Prince Charles, already the patron, gave us our strap line, a spiritual beacon for the new millennium. As we celebrate the feast of St. James in this glorious place, the accumulated labor of saints and benefactors down the centuries, we cannot avoid the resonance of Santiago de Compostela, we honour St. James as the patron of pilgrimage. In particular, we are in the company of those tens of thousands over the centuries who have been inspired by St. James to walk the Camino de Santiago as a spiritual exercise. In this secular age, it's worth reflecting that challenge seems to be ever more popular and undimmed. In many ways, faith as pilgrimage, as exploration, as seeking, retains immense power. Journey is central to the biblical portrayal of the ministry of Jesus. He was always on the move. Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The apostles were invited to join that itinerant lifestyle. St. James was not furnished with all the answers before he responded to the call of Christ. He was called to a journey, to be adventurous for God, to trust and to explore. You remember Jesus finds the two sons of Zebedee in their boat beside the Sea of Galilee, mending their nets. And we gather, immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They were to journey around Galilee and at least once on that Passover of destiny, make the journey from Galilee to Jerusalem with thousands of pilgrims from Palestine and far beyond. That adventure of pilgrimage is beautifully captured by St. Mark in a way that anticipates the numinous fear of the women fleeing the tomb on Easter Sunday. Mark recounts, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those that followed were afraid. The apostles were open to the journey with all of its enigma, uncertainty, and numinous potential. 
they had trusted the call of Jesus and set out without guarantees but ready for the encounters of the soul and the lessons that the journey would afford. They were open to those God moments when the Spirit stirs in the human heart. To be an apostle was to be a patron of pilgrimage, a duty which was to fall above all to St. James. One of the themes that Jesus used in his teaching about the kingdom of God was the joy of a wedding celebration. Not only does the Jesus tradition recollect that Jesus and his disciples attended a wedding at Cana of Galilee, but he used the wedding banquet to illustrate various of his parables. Crucial to these events was the invitation and the summons that went out when everything was ready. Perhaps the single word that sums up the identity and distinctiveness of the Christian gospel is that it comes as invitation. We live in a perplexing world. We don't have all the answers. There's no consulting the back of the book, not even in the Bible. Yet in the life of Jesus, there is an invitation, a reaching out, a summons. A hand is placed on our shoulder and we are invited on the journey to follow Christ. Jesus' powerful teaching. We only need to have the story of the Good Samaritan in our back pocket. Jesus' striking example. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The numinous breaking through in his death and resurrection. These all come as grace, as initiative, as invitation to get us going on the journey of faith. We are called simply to be responsive, to make our lives a journey, not to have all the questions answered, but to set out in trust. Christ first invites follow me. In many ways, the smaller pilgrimages to Compostela, to Iona, to Teze, to the Holy Land, to Bury St. Edmunds, or wherever, are parables of our whole life's journey. Times of special pilgrimage are an intense focus of what our lives are called to be. Over the years I've led pilgrimages, spiritual journeys to many places in the Middle East with its biblical landscape. They are all journeys undertaken in the spirit of faith seeking understanding and they always yield a revelation. When you are traveling, the landscape so often taken for granted at home, is suddenly significant and vital. That's true whether you are walking, close to sunshine and rain, enjoying the spectacular scenery of valleys, streams and paths, or even in a coach. I remember a guide in Jordan getting us out of the bus in the middle of the desert to inspect a single black iris, the national flower that had defied the arid terrain. Pilgrimage leads you to an awareness of the sheer gift of creation. Every pilgrimage journeying together is like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. If you travel together, you share stories, share incidents, share meals, risk intimacies, 
and discover the giftedness in relationships. If you're in the shower and have forgotten your towel, you depend on someone else. Pilgrimage is about community, which reflects the community of God himself. I think also almost every pilgrimage I have led has jolted us with a moment of unexpected hospitality, sheer kindness and grace, which is transparent to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I remember in the middle of the Sinai Desert, the guide spotting some Bedouin on the horizon. Do you want to meet them, he said. The bus careered off the road across the desert to their encampment. They didn't wait to be asked. In seconds, the women were gathering sticks for a fire, the men kneading bread and boiling black tea. We were seated on cushions in the carpeted tent, reminiscent of the hospitality of Abraham. We couldn't understand their language, but we could read their generous hospitality. It was an Emmaus Road moment. The patronal festival of St. James celebrates the apostle of pilgrimage. It reminds us that Jesus called St. James to a journey that was to take him far from the security of a Galilean fisherman. It reminds us too that the heart of gospel faith is the invitation issued in Christ that we should make our lives a pilgrimage of faith. We are called to live beautifully and to die hopefully in response to the Paschal mystery. Alleluia. Amen.